Cemetery. Okay, if you'll turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 6, verse 13. Romans chapter 6, verse 13. When you look at your Bible, there should be three things that stand out if you followed what we were doing. In verse 6, there should be a big capital K. I have a circle around mine to make it stand out. In verse 11, I have an A, capital A, in the margin with a big circle around it. And in verse 13, the one that we're in now, I have a big S with a circle around it. Now, this is an acrostic. The K stands for knowing, that is knowing that our old self was crucified. We are dead to the old self. And the A in verse 11 is acknowledging of that fact. We need to acknowledge it to ourselves that indeed it is real. And then the S, where we are tonight in verse 13, has to do with submitting, yielding or submitting to the commands of God. We have one more to go, and it is in verse 17. And that will be a T, a capital T, with a, I just put circles around it and make them highlight. And that will finish the acrostic, which spells out cast, K-A-S-T. I know that cast starts with a C, but we're spelling it with a K. And I also like the idea of cast because we are to cast our cares upon him for he cares for us. So that's something that you can rely on. You can go back to that and you want to know the synopsis of what we have been learning in Romans chapter 6. That is the basis, basis of it. Cast. Knowing, acknowledging, yielding, or submitting, and thanksgiving. Okay, let's see if this is going to work here this evening. Hmm. What do you know about that? I'm going to turn this off. This, hmm. <laughs> this usually happens on Sundays, not on Tuesdays. Okay, that shows it to go off. Does it go on? Well, we might not have any visual notes for you. I'm going to turn, I'll just turn it off like this. Sorry about this delay. I never know when these things are going to happen. I uh, know. Well, we might, uh, let me try to see if it's going to come on again. You know, usually you can hear that fan going when you turn it off. I don't hear the fan going. Is that the fan? Okay. We'll, let, we'll wait until that fan goes off, and then we'll try it again. But you'll just have to be looking at your Bibles for right now. So in Romans chapter 6, verse 13, we have, to, to my left of that verse, in the margin I have that S, and I have submit. That's what this verse is about. For the most part, we have Romans 6.13 says, And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves. Now, that present could be yield yourselves. I like the, the word submit more than, than, than yield. About the only time I... See, the word yield is on a yield sign on a highway. But present yourselves or yield yourselves 
to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Ah, I can't blame it on the computer. <laughs> now let's see what happens. Well, there it is. Okay. Thank you, Scott. What? Yeah, I know it's still trying to get its footing here. Okay, so now you can see what I was looking at. Get rid of this. I want it a little bigger. You like it? Let's see if I this will make it bigger. Can you all see it okay? Okay. Okay, so we have the verse. It's a pretty long verse. And we take it apart at a time. So the first part says, Do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin. And the word for presenting is paristemi. P-A-R-I-S-T-E-M-I in the Greek. It's a present active imperative. So we are to continue to present the members of our body to sin, not to present our members of our body to sin. And it's important because it's a, a mandate. It's a command. And go on presenting means to place beside, put at someone's disposal, to cause something or to serve as something. We went over this last time, but we're just going to do a quick flyover. In 1 John 2, 15 through 16, it says, Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of God, actually that should be far, you need to note that, the love for God is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, is not the Father, not of the Father, but is of the world. We made the point that this World is the sixth de definition in the BDAG lexicon, and it means the humanity in general, or the, <coughs> or the world, and everything that belongs to it appears as that which is hostile to God, that is lost in sin, wholly at odds with anything divine, ruined, and depraved. So, we are not to love the world. And you might think, well, you just said the word, it, this means to be lost in sin, at odds with anything divine, ruined, and depraved. Why would I love the world? Because those definitions describe us as well, don't they? That's why we love the world. And so, we will either be hostile towards God or we will be hostile to the world. There's no middle ground there. God and the world are mutually exclusive. Our time on earth, or excuse me, our time, our thoughts, our money, our energy, our love, and our dedication will be directed towards God or the world. Again, there's no middle ground. And of course, the pride of life is referring to the arrogance that makes us think we can make life worth work apart from God. And that is a silly thought. Let's cruise on down here. I'm sorry for my sniffing. I don't know if you can hear it, but this thing sounds pretty loud, so I'll make a concerted effort not to sniff. Now, this is a good part that where, where, where Paul comes into play. Uh, at the top here, it says, one way we show our love to Christ is to give up or sacrifice the worldly things that please us in order to do the things that please him. We have the ability to do that, but we gave uh, God gave us free will so we can make choices to do whatever we want. But we can show our love 
to God by submitting to his authority instead of our own authority. We submit to the authority of our, our will to the authority of God's will. And this is what Paul said when he recognized that all the things that he had worked for that were really important to him, when you compare them to Christ, they're nothing but rubbish or dumb. This is Philippians 3, 7, and 8. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet, indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, and I that I may gain Christ. Phenomenal what he's saying here. And that, of course, is a goal that we should have is take the things that attract us which are against what Christ would have us do and throw them into the dustbin of history so that I may gain Christ. Now, it doesn't mean that he had to do that in order to gain Christ like he wasn't a believer and you have to do that in order to be saved. It doesn't have anything to do with that. But it has to do with enhancing and developing a closer relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ, and that should be priority one. And if you are involved in all the stench of the world and all the things that are going on there, then your relationship with Christ is going to suffer. And so Paul recognized that, and he just relegated it all as rubbish and not have anything to do with it. This is where we start our lesson tonight, Lesson 157. And we're, co we're covering the members of our body, which we saw in the verse above. And the members of your body, the members are melos, M-E-L-O-S, in the Greek. This is an aorist passive neuter. Excuse me, this is a noun. This is accusative, a plural neuter. And it, it's a part of the human body a member, a part, or a limb. Here's a quote from Earl Rodmacher in the Nelson Study Bible, New King James Version. This is what he says. Believers are not to present the parts of their bodies as a means of sinning. Simply put, do not use hands to steal or your tongue to lie. You can choose how you're going to use the members of your body, and this is just a very uh, short illustration of how we use our members and this first part of this verse says we are not to use them in order to yield to the world and uh, go against what Christ would have us do. The next part of the verse here says but present yourselves to God as those alive from the world. You'll notice with this same word here present is the same word we have up here. So here's, this is what we've looked at already. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. That is the thing we are not to do, but do this. And present is the same word, paristemi, this is a present active imperative used the first time here. Not to go on presenting your members. And so now we're seeing the same word here. Present. So we'll get down here to this and you'll see. Here it is. But present yourselves to God. Now this is an aorist active imperative. We are to, in a point of time, we are going to make this decision and work and, and use it to obey this command. It's a mandate. And the word present here can be taken as yield or submit. The fact that believers are commanded to submit to submit themselves to God indicates that we have the ability to obey or disobey the mandate. Isn't that true? Anytime someone says, you are to do this, but don't do that, that means we have a choice to do either one. 
And so every time you see a mandate, a command in the Bible, then you know that we have the ability to either obey that command or we can ignore that command. We are the ones that make the choice. We are the ones that pay the consequences when we are more in, it's more important to us to satisfy ourselves than it is to satisfy God. Many believers essentially leave God out of their lives and don't realize they are being disobedient to Him. They might go to church sometimes, and maybe once a month, or maybe they just go to church one time a week on Sunday, and they think, well, this is my duty, I'm doing about what everybody else does, so I ought to be okay. They don't realize that we are commanded to grow in grace and knowledge and assemble ourselves together for the study of God's Word. There's a lot of mandates that they are breaking, and they're not even aware of it. If you ask them, where, we, where in the spectrum of Christians, zero being the worst Christian and a hundred being the best Christian, there's no such thing, but just for the sake of, uh, of seeing where they were, they say, I was probably about 50, right in the middle. That's what they would think. I'm starting right here now. <clears throat> They have a cavalier attitude towards God, which can be described like this. I will let you know if I need any help. That's the way they look at God. He is like an insurance policy to them that can be can, uh, called on for help whenever they need, whenever needed, but not someone to obey. There are millions of believers who fit that category. They are biblically ignorant. They are arrogant to think that they don't need Christ in their life. And I'm talking about genuine believers. These are not just professing believers. These are mediocre, I might even say the average believer, for the most part, thinks this way. And when I hear about the polls, um, they poll Christians on the things they believe, it's something like nearly three-fourths of believers don't even think that the Word of God is inspired. And, and they don't think that Jesus, they think Jesus Christ was a good person, but he wasn't God, he wasn't the Son of Man. And these are professing Christians. So it's not that big a stretch to see that people who have an attitude to God, I, I, I don't need to pray, I don't need to do these things, because if I need him, I'll let him know. And that is... Uh, it's a horrible commentary on the way things are these days, but it could be even worse than this. So I have a quote here, kind of, uh, kind of illustrate, illustrate this. I got this from the Encyclopedia of 7,700 Illustrations. Years ago, a young man began a small cheese business in Chicago. He failed. He was deeply in debt. You didn't Take God into your business. You have not worked with him, said a Christian friend to him. Then the young man thought, hmm, if God wants to run the cheese business, he can do it, and I'll work for him and with him. From that moment, God became the senior partner in his business. The business grew and prospered and became the largest cheese concern in the world. You might ask the name of that young man. It was J.L. Kraft, who became the president of the Kraft Cheese Company. I didn't know that. I assume it's true. So kudos to him. I might buy a little Kraft cheese. We must remember that any, at any given time, we are submitting to God or we are submitting to Satan. We are either spiritual or carnal. A woman is either pregnant or not pregnant. There is no middle ground. We are either in the divine dinosphere or we are in the cosmic system. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with these terms. The divine dinosphere is a word coined by Colonel R.B. Thiem, Jr., the uh, past pastor of Baraka Church. 
And of course, you know what the word divine means. But the dinosphere comes from two Greeks, Greek words. Dina comes from dunamos, which means power, where we get the word dynamite. And sphere comes from the word sphira, which means an area or a, 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 a area that forms a sphere. The divine, a dinosphere. So we are either operating in the divine dinosphere. We could say that when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, then we are in the divine dinosphere. Or we are in the cosmic system. So the cosmic system is the sphere of Satan. The cosmic is where we get, cos it comes from cosmos, and it has to do with uh, the world, the world system of Satan. So we can't say that, well, I feel like I'm a pretty good Christian because uh, I go to church, and how often that one goes, it, I don't know. But people can go to church every time the doors are open, and if they're teaching false doctrine, what is it going to help? How's it going to help them? And if they go to a church that teaches accurately, there might be an ice pastor there. Then, if they don't attend, what good is it for them? And usually, Bible churches, if you miss a, a, a Sunday or two Sundays or three Sundays or, or whenever they teach. You get behind because there's actually substance being taught. And you will not be able to connect the dots if they've already had two or three lessons on something and you come in and you're kind of lost. So you have to choose. By the way, nobody can make that choice for you. We choose whether we're going to live and function in the divine dinosphere or whether we're going to live in the cosmic system. I can tell you one thing. The cosmic system is easier to join. You can join in the cosmic system anytime because it feels good. It's what you want to do. It's easy. But it always ends in death where the divine dinosphere is harder to live in that sphere because it goes against our inclination to sin. However, it is always leads to life, newness of life, and great things. The last phrase in this is, as those alive from the dead. We're not to allow sin to take command of any part of our body and use it as a weapon for evil purposes. Now, I know y'all are Christians, and y'all look very saintly and pious tonight. But I also know that what I'm talking about here of, of using our members as members of our body as a weapon for evil purposes, I know that we all know what I'm saying here because we have all gone there. And evil can manifest itself in hundreds of ways. So if you wanted a, a position in a company and you have worked hard for it and you deserve it, and somebody else is put in that position, you have a choice. Are you going to say, okay, that was unjust, but I'm going to leave that in the Lord's hands. Maybe he's got something better for me somewhere else. You can think that way, and you'd be in the divine dinosphere. But if you thought, I will not let that stand. I worked too hard to get that job. How dare they do that? And you start causing problems in the company, you start assaulting people, not physically, but verbally with other people trying to undermine someone's authority or get that person out of there. That's using the parts of your body as a weapon for evil purpose. And you know what weapon, I mean, not what weapon, but it, yeah, it is a weapon. What part of your body would be used the most in a situation like that? Of course, yeah. We get more, I don't know about you, but I think I can say, speak for all of us. I know that I get in trouble whenever I get in trouble with my tongue more than anything else. James says, if you can control your tongue, paraphrasing, then you're a mature believer. It's not easy to do. 
The tongue is a small member, but it has huge impact. And James talks about it's like the rudder of a ship isn't that big, but it determines which way the ship is going to be going. There are many believers who are physically alive, but they walk around as if they were dead because they have no relationship with Jesus Christ. You see them all the time. I mean, when you see a panorama of a downtown New York and all the people, they look like ants. And each one of, them, one of them have their own story, their own way of living. Now, they are all, they are all physically alive, but inside they are dead. They are usually, well, I'll read that one line again. There are many believers who are physically alive, but they walk around as if they were dead because they have no relationship with Jesus Christ. They are usually confused, afraid, and angry because something is missing in their life. They are never satisfied and never feel secure or contented. You know people like that, don't you? How important is your relationship with the Lord to you? How important is Bible doctrine to you? Well, that speaks a lot towards whether you are alive where it counts inside. But there are a lot of people who are walking around who have the accoutrements of things that make them happy. They, they, they look like they're happy. They look like things are well, but it's, it's covered up. Some of the most miserable people can hide how, how miserable they are inside. They're miserable, but they put on a facade. And, oh, hi, how you? Oh, everything is fine. And, and I, it's dandy. And they go on and on. But really on the inside, there's no light on. And that's because they are empty because it's not filled with the Lord Jesus Christ. These people never are satisfied and never feel secure or contented. If you're a believer and you're living without Jesus Christ as number one in your hit parade, then even though you're a believer and though, even though you have phenomenal uh, potential of what God can do with you, if you are not searching, if you are not growing, if you are ignorant and don't do anything about it, then you're not going to be satisfied and you're not going to be secure and you're not going to be contented because only Jesus Christ can feel all those things. He's the only one. And there are a lot of fake things that people get into, and they think uh, uh, this happens a lot of time with either famous people or rich people. They have everything they can want, they want, and yet they're bored. They're empty, and so they uh, those who aren't well off, they will try to sublimate with alcohol or drugs or sex or anything they can do to get their mind off of their life that they hate. Even believers can be in that same state. So when we're talking about, in this verse, this phrase, and those alive from the dead, your relationship with the Lord is going to determine where you fall in that metric. And unfortunately, most believers are confused and they're angry and they're, they, they just are a miserable people. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 through 15. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 through 15. For the love of God controls us. Uh-oh, there's something else I forgot to plug in. <clears throat> I'm glad they uh, give me a little heads up. Did it get brighter? Okay. 
Sorry about another interruption here. So let's start with that again. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15. For the love of God controls us. Just think about that again. For the love of God controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. Verse 15. And he died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. I want you to look at this word right here. Or just this one word. You see that? So that those who live might no longer live for themselves. All the things that Christ has done for us and all the potential every believer has is still only a potential. That might means that live means they might no longer, no longer live for themselves, but then again, they might. That's a subjunctive mood. And so the potential to living the abundant life and having things that most people yearn to have but never have because they're looking in the wrong places. They be, believe the lies that if they only had more money, if they had a better house or a better spouse, whatever it is they think is going to make life better, if it's not a better relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, it is futile. And when God gave us volition, He gave us the will to either no longer live for themselves, ourselves, but live to him who died and rose again on our behalf. So you probably heard it said before that it's better to give than receive. And that is true. It's when you start thinking about other people and sacrifice for them that you start to experience what happiness is. But the thing is, most people, they are living for themselves because we are, we come with the default selfishness. That's our default, who we are. But when we are no longer living for ourselves, but we're living for him, we sacrifice doing what we want to do for the things that we should do, and we do it because of our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. The first thing that happens when you decide you're going to go your way and not God's way is guilt. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a heavy burden. It is for most people. So doesn't that go along with rising from the dead? Look at, look at it right here. As those alive from the dead... And then we have, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. This is, we have the will, and we can use them for ill, or we can use them for instruments of righteousness to God. The members of our body can be compared to a hammer. Now, I'm not saying they look like a hammer, but they can be compared to a hammer. I'm sorry, that's kind of things that I think about. I was in construction for 10 years, so I know quite a bit about hammers. Hammers can be used to build strong, beautiful homes or they can be used to tear down and demolish something. It all depends on whose hand is it is in and what the condition of the soul is in that person. Do you know hammers? I wonder, I don't know how many times, but you, do you know hammers have been used for a lot of murders? You're looking around for a hammer and, I mean, a weapon. If there's nothing else left, a hammer will do the job. So, again, it's a choice that we make. We can use our tongues to encourage someone. Now, I'm talking about using our members as instruments of righteousness to God. And here's some illustrations. We can use our tongues to encourage someone rather than put them down. An encouragement, what does encouragement mean a lot? We can use our hands to caress rather than strike, our arms to carry someone's load rather than ignore their need, 
our ears to listen to others rather than do all the talking, our brains to inform rather than ridicule, and our eyes to look for the good in others rather than the bad. A few examples of how we can use the members of our bodies as instruments of righteousness to God. And by the way, all of these comparisons are going to sway one way or the other compared to your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. If there is no relationship, then you're going to be on the bad side of every one of these. Now, when I say no relationship, there are believers, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have a permanent relationship with God and Jesus Christ in the sense that we are God's children and we are in Christ. We are permanently identified with Jesus Christ that has phenomenal things that we could have. Being righteous is to be right. And when we are right with God, both in relationship and function, then his righteousness will be formed in us. We can't grit our teeth and say, okay, I'm going to build some righteousness. I think I'll go out in the gym and I'll pump about 25 uh, iron here, 25 uh, reps on a bench press. And I'm going to credit it to righteousness. <laughs> Silly, isn't it? I mean, we can't do anything in ourselves to develop righteousness because we're not righteous in and of ourselves. Like I said, our default position in with regards to who we are is, number one, selfish. Well, it's all about us. But being right is what it means to be righteous. Anytime you hear the word righteousness, if you think it's some kind of hard term to think about. Righteousness just means being right. God is super righteous because he's always right, never been wrong. So when we are right with God, both in our relationship with him in our spiritual life and in function, if your spiritual life is right, then we're going to function in ways that we are thinking about other people. Then his righteousness will be formed in us. Now, you already have his righteousness in a positional sense. You all know that. We're talking about experiential here. Verse 14, Romans 6, 14. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Is that a fantastic promise there? For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. It's kind of uh, a lot here, but we'll launch into it. Shall not be master is one word as cur uh cur -e -o. Let me read me let me get this right. Curry -u -o. There you go. Curry -u -o. It's a verb, it's a future active indicative. This is something that happens in the future in a point of time and it is a reality. Is is that this means that it's not just a potential that sin shall not be master over you. It is something that is absolutely a reality. And curry uo means to be master of or dominate. So this is, says, for sin shall not be master of you or dominate you. And there is no willy-nilly wishy-washing about it. It says it's not going to do it. The reason that Paul could make such a fantastic statement is because of what happens the moment someone believes the gospel. God does so many things in that instant which lays the foundation for this verse to stand on. You can't just say that and say, oh, it's okay. There's a whole foundation behind this that makes this credible. And we're talking about what happens the moment of salvation. We receive the gift of eternal light, life and the righteousness of God. The moment, the instant that we put our faith alone in Christ alone. We are justified. 
sanctified, regenerate. Do you all know, do you all, do you all know these terms? You need to know what these terms are. I think you know, but if you want, I will explain them. But if you're okay to go, well, I'll just go on. We are justified. We're justified because we have the righteousness of God. Sanctified, set apart for a blessing in a positional way. Regenerated. What is it, do you all know what it means to be regenerated? Well, the fact that it's regenerated means you've been generated once already. And now you're regenerated. We were generated with a physical body at birth. And now we are regenerated with a new birth. To be regenerated. The, because of so many things that I'm going to be naming here. We are adopted at that point in time. Baptized or identified with the Holy Spirit. Indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Sealed with the Holy Spirit. Identified with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. Our old self is crucified. Our old sin nature is, is domination ends and we die to sin. That's just a few of the things that happen the instant that we have faith alone in Christ. Some say there's 40 things. Some say 50. Some say 60. No matter what the numbers are, all these numerous things happen in an instant. We receive all these things and many more without feeling anything, without experiencing anything, and without even knowing that these things take place. But they are very real. When I think back of when I was saved, I'm not sure when it was because I walked the aisle about every other Sunday. And I want to make sure I wasn't left out of heaven for sure. However, I didn't feel it. Did you? What does it feel like to be regenerated? What does it feel like to be baptized by the Holy Spirit? What, does it have, what, what is the imputation of eternal life and God's own righteousness feel like? You don't know. We don't know till later on after we start studying the Bible, that these things even happened or even existed. And a lot of people dismiss the things that I've had here and as well as other things that I'm not naming because they didn't feel it. They weren't emotional. Some people think you have to get all emotional and all fuzzy inside and all whenever you believe the gospel. It doesn't have anything to do with that. So why I illustrated these things is because just because you didn't feel it, just because you didn't know that it happened, you didn't know anything about it, does not mean they are not real. They are absolutely real. They're real enough to where we can structure our lives based upon these things that happen. We can have confidence that we don't have to have or allow sin to dominate us because of the things that were just given here. We are identified with Christ's death. So everything that we were prior to salvation is dead. So that we can realize the great potential of our new life in Christ. Do you understand that? Just like a, a, a seed dies, it has to die before it can be planted and come to life. And our old self had to die and dead and so that we could come to life and have the newness of life. But the fact that all that is dead and it's a reality that took place should give us great encouragement. We don't have to be down and think, oh, well, I never can do any better. I can never make it or anything. We want to realize the great potential of our new life in Christ because our old self is dead. The old sin nature has been neutered. It no longer has domination over us. We have a, a human spirit that we didn't have before. I didn't even name that. There's a lot of things that I didn't name here. But that's to give us encouragement where we can sin 
less. We can be sinless, but we can sin less. And when we sin less, we have a stronger and more intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what matters. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. Y'all have seen this before. It's a major verse. And it has to do exactly with what this verse is talking about. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, 18. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that's a first class condition, it means if, and it's true. You could say, therefore, since anyone is in, or everyone is in Christ, this is talking about all believers, he is a new creature. Something drastic happened to become a new creature, does it not? The old things passed away, and that's what I just was talking about. The things that died because we were identified with Christ on the cross, they passed away, they're gone. They have to die so that we can be a new creature. Behold, new things have come. We have opportunity, we have potential, we have so many things that we did not have as an unbeliever. Verse 18. Now, all these things are from who? God. A lot of people read these verses and they say, okay, you, you've been born again. They don't know what the importance of being in Christ and that you're a new creature. The old things have passed away. Now, I've heard, heard adults tell their children, okay, you walk the aisle, you're a believer now, and so you better, better stop all your bad habits and you better stop start minding me and not sassing me. They go through this whole thing. They miss the whole point. We cannot have the be a new creature and have all these new things come based on anything that we do. That's why in the very next verse it says, now all these things are from God. You can't work your way. You can't do anything to make these happen. This is, these are gifts that God gives us. Now, all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ that was on the cross. Now we're, we're reconciled with God. Not only are we reconciled, I didn't put reconciliation. There's so many things I could have added to the list a while ago. Who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So we need to pass along what happened to us when we believed the Lord Jesus Christ to others. It's, it's our ministry. It's our duty to do it. Now, listen to this. Sin will not be master over us, not because the sin nature is dead, but that we are dead to it. The old sin nature is just as caustic and slimy and horrible as it ever has been, but it doesn't have dominion over us anymore. We are dead to it. Even though it's not dead to us, we are dead to it. It has no power over us unless we give it to it. So sin will not be master over us, not because the sin nature is dead, but we are dead to it. We are no longer under its tyrannical powers. There's a definite break between who we were before we were saved and who we are after we're saved when we become a new creature, a new person with a stupendous potential that didn't exist before. Something phenomenal and tremendous happened at that point. We don't feel it. We don't even know. How many believers, the great majority of believers, don't know any of this stuff so they can't be encouraged by it? You have to... Did you see how important knowledge is? So we know that we became a new creature, a new person, a stupendous potential that, ex that didn't exist before. God is responsible for all of what is stated above. The only thing we did was believe the gospel, so we can't take any credit for any of the wonderful things that God did for us. All we do is say, yeah, I believe that. Bam! There it happened. An explosion. It's like a nuclear bomb went off with all the things that God did for us and we're saying, oh, 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 you know, we don't even know what happened. We don't even know it. But we know it now. And we are so blessed to know these things because this is going to enhance our relationship with the Lord and there's nothing more important than that. 
Uh, we, we, we're not defeated in the idea that, well, we're going you know, to sin, we're all, you know, blah, blah, blah. No. Our old self has died. Sin, the old sin nature no longer has power over us. We have tremendous assets now that we didn't have before. So Paul is saying, why are you letting sin reign over you and control your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust? Knowing all this, why are you doing that? It's crazy. He is what he's saying, stop sinning. You no longer have to sin, so stop it. That's what Paul is telling us. And a lot of people say, I can't stop it. You can't stop it completely, but can you, sh you can sure put a big dent in it. And that's what we should strive to do. What is our motivation? What, what do we get out of it? Well, we have a stronger relationship with Jesus Christ. What, uh, what could you ask for more? He becomes more real to you. You talk to him more. You thank him more. You ask him for more. He becomes number one in your life, which is where he is supposed to be. When we make these sacrifices, it is only our reasonable duty to do that. Look what he's done for us. Huh. <sighs> I'm, I'm sorry to make that sound, but I just looked at the clock and I'm looking at what I've got here. I don't think I'm going to launch in for you are not under the under law, but under grace. Yeah, I know. But if I get into this, it's, it's, it's not going to be... If Oh, oh, I just thought of something. I'm glad I, it just came into my mind. We are not going to have Bible class this Thursday. Uh they say it's going to be 23 and there's a chance of uh, particip participation, per precipitation. It might be uh, wet and 23 degree, degree weather and rain don't go together very well. And so I think even, even if it was just 23 degree weather, there's not many people going to want to get out into that. So I'm just going to curtail that and let everybody know now that we will not have it this Thursday. So I... Uh, uh, I'm going to draw a line in the sand here. I, but before I, I stop, I just want you to look at the wording. For you are not under law. Pretty clear, isn't it? But under grace. Now this is more complicated. It's a hard. This this what I just showed you right here takes quite a bit of an explaining for you to really understand what's there. That's why I don't want to just spend a couple of minutes on it now and then uh, I'd like to start afresh. Yes. I said that on a Sunday, didn't I? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I said that sin can only... Uh, have sway over us if we give it permission. If we don't give it permission, it is locked in its cage. So I guess whenever we get to that point to where we are struggling, when we get to Romans 7, Paul just throws it all out there. That's what I would do. I don't do that. What I don't want to do, that's what I do. Oh, wretched man, not I am. Have you ever been there like a thousand times? So all this is laying the groundwork. So all this is going to come together and make us sin less. Not sinless, sin less. And that's going to be better for us. It's going to be better for everybody around us. It's going to enhance our relationship with God because every time you sin, your relationship with God is shut down. That temporary relationship, of course, He's always our God. We're always His children. These Passages are very meaty. They're something that you have to think about and not just say, oh, well. But when you do, uh, you obey what are, you're not obeying Paul, you're obeying the Lord. When he's saying, stop sinning, you, not, you don't have to. And all the benefits are with you when you don't. So just stop it. And we've got the Holy Spirit on our side as well. He's going to help us. 
Any questions? Okay, let's close. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the book of Romans in chapter 6, these things that we are learning about that few talk about and even fewer know anything about. But they meet, they are very meaningful to us because it is building us up. We're building righteousness within our soul so that we will know how important it is to not be selfish, not to do what is what we want to do for ourselves, but we want to please our Lord Jesus Christ and we want to be good and faithful servants. And we can be. We can make the decision to do it. So whenever we are in that limbo land where we're trying to decide whether we do something naughty or not or whatever it is, that we will remember these things and recognize it's never worth it. There's always those consequences. So we thank you for these things. Help us to meditate on these to the point to where we can explain them to other people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.